Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Jeff. I'm an alcoholic. And I'm beyond delighted to be here. This has just been a wonderful experience. Uh, I want to thank Pixie. I want to thank Jack. In particular, I want to thank Mark for being just such a wonderful host today. It was I just feel like royalty. And, uh, you know, if I went back to the old detox and told the guys how it was, <laughs> they just wouldn't believe I mean, this just was nowhere on the radar 25 and a half years ago that, that I'd get on a plane and... and uh, be treated the way you've treated me. And I'd like to thank my dear friend from elementary school, Maria, and her husband. They came up here from, uh, Maria and Matt, they came up here from uh, Vancouver, Washington, uh, to kind of hang out with me today. We've been friends since first grade. And uh, so I'm honored. I mean, this is a supreme honor for me. And in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, Dr. Silkworth was mentioning that uh, Bill had these ideas. And then Bill asked, uh, if he could have the privilege of talking to some of the other patients. So I believe that this is a privilege as well, as an honor, and it's a responsibility. And I don't take it lightly. But I have my fun socks on. These are, <laughs> these are real fun socks. That's what they said. Bought them. And, uh, so, uh, you know, I'm just delighted to be here. You know, uh, Mark picked me up from the airport and then, you know, we picked up Maria and, and Matt, and we went around and, and drove around this magnificent day in this magnificent place where you guys all live. Uh, and it's really just been, a, and we had dinner with some wonderful people, some members of this group, and, and uh, it's just been a surreal experience. I mean, things like this don't happen to people like me, where I came from and what I'm like today. So uh, the young lady just read about it you know, and the promises. We will not regret the past, nor would she shut the door on it. So I'm going to say a few revealing things tonight and hope that maybe somebody can identify. How many people do we have here that are in their first third, first year? Great. Congratulations. Uh just like we go into the prison, we have a prison in our town, and it's 10 minutes from the house, and, and we go in there, and uh, just like I tell the prisoners every time that I go in there, and these are a lot of lifers and long-time guys that are in there, and uh, I tell them, you know, if this thing didn't work, if I didn't think Alcoholics Anonymous would work in your life, I'd, if I didn't think it would transform your life and change it to and put you in a place, regardless of your circumstances, above and beyond where you're currently at, I wouldn't be here. You know, I'd be watching TV. And and if Alcoholics Anonymous hadn't done that for me, I wouldn't be here either. I would not be alive today. I have a sobriety date. It's December 25th, 1990. Um, and I hope and pray that that's always my sobriety date and that I'm always willing to do whatever it takes to maintain that sobriety date. Because in my experience and my belief in being an Alcoholics Anonymous for a quarter of a century... There's something very spiritual about a sobriety date where your current living situation, the desperation and the loneliness and the futility of living life comes together at the same time where the opportunity to get sober happens. And it's just it's this spiritual thing that happens in your life. So hang on to it because it may not come around again. It may not come around again. So, man... Dig in, stay here, become become one of us, do what we do. Um, you know, they read the traditions today, and I want to talk a few minutes about the traditions. And those are the kind of the undercurrent that makes this this meeting and other meetings and Alcoholics Anonymous run smoothly. You know, and we've been greeted by people that have had spiritual awakenings. We've also been greeted by people that are practicing the 12 traditions. You know, and each individual, uh, in my experience, if... If I don't practice unity in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, if, if I don't practice, if I don't make the new people feel welcome, if I don't get along with this guy or that gal or this guy and I show it in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and somehow create friction in the meeting, then I'm not practicing unity. If a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and Alcoholics Anonymous as a whole, if we don't 
you know, the, the traditions are designed, you know, Bill talked about the problem is we're, we're, we're alcoholics. <laughs> And, uh, you know, we've got very spiritual, uh, diseases when we come in here. So we act in a different way when you come to Alcoholics Anonymous. We change our behavior. So the objective in, in, in the first tradition is to become unified, to act as one. Everybody's helping each other around. Everybody's got a pat, patting somebody on the back. Come on, come back to another meeting. Your first meeting, uh, I'm glad you're here. One of the very first meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous I went to was a, I was at an Alano club and they said this meeting provides dinner, uh, for newcomers if you're in your first 30 days. And I said, well, that's me, <laughs> you know. So I went to there and I, of course I ordered the prime rib. And, uh, and, and I went there and there was a panel of people up there and they were talking about Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know if it was step one. I don't know if it was step three. I don't know if it was the traditions. I have no idea what they said, but what I got out of that was the kindness. It was palpable. I couldn't believe that these people would would offer me a place at the table with them and buy me dinner and, and display Alcoholics Anonymous in such a way that it was attractive, that made me want to come back. You know, that, that's unity. In, in, our, in our second uh, tradition, it talks about for a group purpose, there's but one ultimate authority. A loving God as He may express Himself, and uh, and, and for me, uh, that's what happens when I come to Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, one of my favorite speaker, one of my favorite speakers, a guy named Charlie C, and he's from Southern California, and he says, you know, I I needed this spiritual thing. I needed God to jump down and pound his chest and say, "Who's your daddy?" You know. And, <laughs> And I, I, I need that same kind of God. You know, I, I need God to disclose himself occasionally. And it seems like it happens for me when I come to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous. Cause no matter what's going on, no matter what's going on here or there, if I've got fear, or I got whatever it is, what's going on, I come to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and I hear God speak through people. And that's how our group conscience works. At least that's my experience is we all come together. And everybody's got ideas and opinions on how things should be done. Some are radical, some are not so radical. But it's the voice, the collective voice of the informed group conscience where, you know, the right thing to do comes out. You know, and I love that we do minority opinion stuff, too. I mean, it could be 99 to 1, and then the person with that's a minority opinion puts their hand up and gives a compelling idea, and everybody goes, oh, okay. Let's do that. You know, just very democratic in that regard. And then in, in our third tradition, it's, uh, you know, the long form of the third tradition says that uh, our membership ought to include all who suffer from alcoholism. And, you know, I suffered from alcoholism long before I, I knew I had it. I suffered from it. And we shortened it up and it says that the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. And so they both work for me. If you're new to Alcoholics Anonymous, it took me a while to figure out what was wrong with me. I just knew something was really, really wrong with me. And by coming to meetings of Alcoholics Anonymous, I eventually came to understand the nature of the spiritual malady I have. Um, you know, our fourth tradition talks about autonomy. Each group can do has their own customs. I mean, this group has a great custom. You know, I know you treat the, the speaker like royalty. I've just, I've never been so loved in my life. Um, but then our fifth, fifth tradition talks about uh, our, our singleness of purpose and our primary purpose. Now, prior to coming to Alcoholics Anonymous, I didn't have a purpose. I, have, I was a purposeless life. I, it was a life wasted. As far as I could see, there was no way of recollect, you know, of, uh, of rebuilding this life. But, and no purpose, no desire to help. And I guess there was a desire to help somebody. But when you're living by the lake, Collecting cans, you know, just not really spiritually attractive to people. <laughs> they usually, we'll get more into that later, but, uh, but, um, yeah, that's what I did. So, uh, you know, the primary purpose for me today is to stay sober and help other alcoholics to achieve sobriety. And the primary purpose of every group is, is to carry the message of Alcoholics Anonymous. And we do it in different ways. There's a variety of meetings. There's, you know, every, kind of meeting under the rainbow. And so 
anybody can fit into Alcoholics Anonymous. That uh, you know, providing that you had at one point in time had had problems with alcohol, could be other things mixed in with that. It took me a while to see the whole picture. But uh, you know, in the sixth tradition, talks about money, property, and prestige, and and I, I've enjoyed great success in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I've seen other people come into Alcoholics Anonymous where money, property, and prestige became more important than being a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and it's cost them their sobriety. You know, out there chasing the buck, out there chasing the nice car. So, you know, these are how I apply the traditions in my life, that no matter what kind of fame or fortune I have, that nothing gets away, gets in the way of my, my AA life. You know, this is the deal for me. Um, seventh tradition, self-supporting. If you don't have any money, help put some chairs away. Do something. Uh, he said with love. Uh, <laughs> be a cookie person, uh, you know. Uh, and I'm going to kind of jump up to the tenth tradition, too, because that applies so powerfully in my life, is that, you know, one of the first things, and nobody in this room for sure, but one of the first things I got back after I came in, I was completely wiped clean, clear slate when I came to alcoholic. Nothing on the chalkboard, nothing. And then what happens is I started uh, developing opinions. You know, I started to develop an opinion about this guy and that gal and develop opinions about this and that. And, and the traditions of Alcoholics Anonymous, I love it. We have no opinion on outside issues. Nothing. You know, people get a hold of the press, they come see, send, you know, a general service office, and they say, these people said this about Alcoholics Anonymous. What's your take? We have no opinion. No opinion. And if, if, if I don't have an opinion about anything, I can't be in conflict with you. You know, we can argue all day about opinions, but you can't argue with my experience. My experience is, is this. And Alcoholics Anonymous has given me this opportunity to, to take this useless life and, and turn it into a productive, useful experience. And then our 11th tradition, which you guys do marvelously in this room, it, it, it talks about, you know, press, radio, TV, and all that being anonymous. It also talks about uh, the principle of attraction rather than promotion. It talks about the principle of attraction rather than promotion. And how I take that is that when I'm in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, am I talking about Alcoholics Anonymous? You know, when I'm in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, am I being welcoming to the next person to come? Come on back. Come on back. Let me get you a cookie. We've got some coffee over here. Let me get you a cup of coffee. How much is it? It's nothing. Come on. Let's get a cup of coffee. How we make Alcoholics Anonymous attractive. This is a life-saving, life-changing thing that we're involved in. It's a spiritual movement. Uh, you know, and then our Tradition 12 talks about... Uh, you know, anonymity too, is that there's really, there's no, no too great a request for me to do something in Alcoholics Anonymous. For what it's given me, I could start tonight, I could, I could labor 24 hours a day until my last breath and not pay back what Alcoholics Anonymous has given to me. So there's no greater sacrifice than service. And, um, you know, Bill wrote, Bill wrote the last, sometimes I get, sometimes I get choked up, okay, so you're gonna have to deal with me here. I did bring some, not just Kleenex, but I got some heavy duty paper towels. I mean, it's, it's not gonna be snot slobber and stuff like that, but you know, I get a little sensitive. I'm a sensitive alcoholic. So, Bill writes at the last of the 12th tradition in the long form, he says, this to the ends that our great blessings may never, never spoil us that we shall forever live in thankful contemplation of him who presides over us all. That's just such a magnificent saying. Uh, it just gets me. didn't get me this time. But uh, I grew up in, uh, in San Diego. Uh, I was the, uh, the third son, and we had three sons and then my little sister. And, uh, you know, for all intents and purposes, we went to a wonderful elementary school and, and things, and, you know, it was back in the day of Ozzy and Harriet and Father Knows Best and all that mind stuff going on back then. And uh, things weren't panning out to my expectations. And so uh, by the time I got to junior high school, I was feeling restless, irritable, and discontent. And uh, our book talks about that. And 
you know, I did this little science fair project, right? And everybody's got their little science, you know, the rats and all this. Well, I did my science fair project on the effects of a thermonuclear blast and just what I could do. And I had the mushroom cloud and all the statistics of what happens if you live within 20 miles. So I was starting to be a, a dour little kid, man, because, it, you know, I felt like everybody lied to me. Like the whole thing. In, in elementary school, we used to jump under our desk every Friday and the alarms would go off and we'd hide under this little wooden desk un with the understanding that that was going to save us from a nuclear attack. <laughs> I mean... That's the biggest lie ever. I mean, the only thing, the table would last longer than we would. I mean, we'd just go, and then gone. So I just knew it was all a setup, right? I just knew the whole thing was a setup. And, uh, and you know, and John Kennedy got shot, and I thought, my God. I, I just, at that time when John Kennedy got shot, I thought, if there was a God, how could this happen? I was 10 years old. Um, and so we're kind of moving along, and, and somewhere in there, all of a sudden, you know, our book talks about uh, the doctor, in, in his opinion, he says men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. And if you're alcoholic, that is understated because I tell you, I, <laughs> alcohol does something for me. And I would imagine for many of you, if not all of you here, it does something for me that just makes everything okay. I mean, it just, it's like, Ugh. I, did, I made the discovery today. My sponsor, Barney, used to talk that. I made the discovery today. I found out when I drink, I feel better. No matter what's going on, if it's good, if it's bad, whatever's going on out there, when I drink, I feel better. And I made that magical discovery when I was 12 years old. And uh, by the time I was 14 years old, I was... Uh, you know, and I was a budding young athlete. I was a really good wrestler and a football player. I had this little, because of my, you know, some home life stuff, I, I had this little violent side to me, and I could get away with it when I was playing sports. But by the time I was 14 years old, uh, I was being marched in front of a continuation high school counselor because I, I got drunk, and, and I went to a football game, um, and I was drinking Jim Beam and aftershave lotion and went to this football game. Yeah, and threw up all over the cop car. They were happy. Uh, and uh, so what happened was, you know, we're sitting here. I'm 14 years old, and the counselor looks at my father, and he says, have you ever thought of sending your son to Alcoholics Anonymous? So that was a long time ago. And uh, <coughs> Well, the good news is I never drank aftershave lotion again. Uh, that was a one-time deal. But, uh you know, I had to do what our, our chapter, the third chapter in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous talks about. You know, going back through my drinking career, I started looking at this, and I'm so glad it's all in the literature because it's all identification. You know, coming to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous and, and hearing somebody tell their story is all identification. God, that's how I drank. That's what I did. That's how I felt before I took a drink. That's what happened when I took a drink, and that's what happened after I took a drink. It's identification. So I did what it talks about in chapter three was I figure the hard stuff is, is, is too much. I got to back off of that. So six months later, I didn't drink for six grueling months. Uh, when I was put back in high school, I shifted to uh, brandy, you know, and I, I became a beer drinker and I became a wine drinker because no matter what kind of trouble I get in, no matter anything else, man, I get in it and I'm in it for the first 15 minutes to 45 minutes or an hour. Man, it is the zone. When I'm there and when I'm in the zone, set off the nuclear blast. I don't care because I'm in heaven right now. I mean, it does that for me. But what happens for me is I chug everything. It doesn't matter whether it's beer. It doesn't matter whether it's hard liquor. It doesn't matter what it is. I don't have an off button. You know, oh, that's that's enough. You know, al say, oh, I've had enough. You know, or, and, and I love al -Anon, Don't get me wrong. But social drinkers say, say stuff like that, you know, gee, I'm starting to feel it. It's Monday. <laughs> it's Monday. I have to go to work tomorrow, you know, and, uh, and I'm a blackout drinker. And, uh, is anybody else in here blackout drinkers? All right. What a form of transportation that is. Isn't it? <laughs> My God, you just, you're here one minute and Tijuana the next, you know, it's like, how did that, what happened? 
And uh, so I'm a blackout, pass out drinker, and I just hate, you know, because I can't stop. Once I start, it's just, God, I, the body, you know, until I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I couldn't understand. I knew I had an abnormal ability to drink a lot of alcohol, but I didn't know there was a physiological reaction to alcohol. But not everybody has that. Not everybody does that. But I do. And many, many people that come to Alcoholics Anonymous have that, that once they start, once they get the first one going, I always thought it was the 10th or the 20th beer. You know, sitting down and drink a case of beer, that's abnormal. I hate to tell you that. I mean, it's abnormal drinking. Uh, but so, you know, I'm starting to discover these things and, and, you know, I discovered girls and did all that and I was a crappy student. I was just very unfocused. So, you know, I ended up bailing out of school because I had a job. You know, my girlfriend's father was a plastering contractor, so I became a plasterer and a hot carry and doing all that. And once I was in that, I said, oh, my God, I've made a terrible mistake. But we don't want to tell anybody we've made a mistake because their pride gets in the way. So uh, I ended up getting a, getting married, drank myself into a marriage and drank myself out of a marriage and drank myself into a career and out of a career and just kind of bounced around the trades. I was doing a lot of different things, did a lot of different things in the trades. But the biggest one was a drink, and I drank a lot. And I, I really didn't like going to work on either Wednesday or Thursday. So I'm a four-day, I originated a four-day work week. And uh, do you have anybody to thank for that? But, uh, so, but they catch on if you're not there. And so things. <laughs> and, you're, you know, I'm the kind of guy who goes out for a pack of cigarettes, and I don't come home for three days. You know, and there's always a story. There's always got together with some old buddies. Oh, man, I don't know. It was just so much. Well, how come you couldn't call? Well, you know, and it was just the, you know, the lies and the, the nonsense. And, and deep inside, I, I know it was wrong. Deep inside, I'm thinking, oh, God, you're a liar, you know? And that something happens where it just becomes important. My daughter, Sarah, was born, and I always said I was going to be a wonderful, loving father, and I was, I was going to do the things that fathers do, and I was going to be supportive, and I was going to be the fun dad, and I'd do all that. and She's two years old, and I come home, my wife's got my bags packed and out on the front porch. You're not welcome here anymore. Hmm. Really? Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I wore her out. Uh, so the book talks about wearing our significant others out. And so I wore her out. And, and, and so for me, what happened was, you know, I started thinking about the you know, the implications of not seeing my daughter on a regular basis. And I started thinking about that, and my life was just a mess. And, you know, was, I couldn't believe, I couldn't see what the problem was. I had no idea what the problem was, but I was in just such such pain that, uh, you know, I took took a handful of volume and drank it down with a bottle of wine, and I crawled up on the roof of our house to die. And on the way up, I called my parents uh, to thank them for being wonderful parents. And uh, But I... I gotta die. I guess I was a bit of a martyr. So, uh, you know, they sent the police. They didn't find me, but then my mother came and my father and they walked, walked around the house and my, my mother had a nickname for me because my hair was white. She said, uh, she nicknamed me Taffy. Don't use that against me. And so she walked around the house, you know, Taffy, Taffy. And, uh, and, uh, you know, I fell off the roof and they pumped my stomach and, and, uh, all that stuff. And it was just another episode, just another, just another dreary episode. I mean, my life was full of these little dreary episodes. So my brother, my oldest brother, is a very successful um, attorney down in San Diego, and everybody in my family is successful. And so what happened um, was he told me one day, he said, how would you like to get into the radio business? I said, I'd love to get into the radio business. Man, I love, you know, I love the entertainment. I love to be in radio. And so he gave, got, got me a job working for a radio station because he him and his partners own some radio stations. So I go to work for this radio station, and uh, they teach me how to be a radio salesman. And but these people have degrees in marketing and communications, and these are real radio people. Man, I'm surrounded by pros, and I just feel one more time like I'm inferior and inadequate. And, and I can't express that to anybody, but I just feel like, God, any minute now they're going to discover that I'm a fake. Any minute now, there's, I'm going to be a phony. I was like a bull in a china shop. I didn't know how to treat people in an office environment. I was a do it my way or the highway kind of guy. I was selling radio. But I was doing a lot of, I was a big shot down in Yuma, Arizona. Uh, 
if there is such a thing. And uh, so what happened for me there was, you know, I was selling a lot of radio and I was doing stuff and I was, I was having fun. And then one day they came in and said, you know, we're getting a mascot for the radio station. How would you like to be the mascot? And I thought, you know, I'd like to do that. You know, we grew up watching the San Diego Chicken, and 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 you know, I had some moves, and and so I put on this thing, and it's it's literally seven foot tall, and it's a road runner, and it has ears, and it's yellow and pink and purple and big floppy feet. So I start doing this, and and under the pretense that they're going to pay me to do it, right? Because they <laughs> they pay the uh, the announcer, the the DJ, he gets a hundred bucks for three hours. So I figured, hey, I'm in the zone, man. I I need this extra money. So I start doing the doing the roadrunner thing, and you know, I'm I discovered that it was really hot in there. So I was <laughs> it's 130 degrees in that outfit. And I I'm not kidding you. And so I would pound down a 12 pack, and then I'd go play with the kids. You know, I got a lot of kids. And I'm moonwalking and, you know, I'm just, I'm just drunk crazy out there and I'm moonwalking and I'm having fun with the little kids. And yeah, you know, I'm doing all this crazy stuff. And one time I go roller skating and, and I'm drunk, absolutely stone faced drunk. And I'm rolling skating with these kids and I can't skate. You know, no way. And so I do an endo and I flip over and all the kids came over and picked me up and stood me back up. And then one of the kids smelled beer on my breath and he told his parents, that little rast, that little bastard ratted me off. I'll tell you, I couldn't believe it. All the love I show these kids, and it, you know, seriously, it's just disrespectful. And so, <laughs> you know, my image was becoming tarnished. I was showing up at bars and uh, getting free drinks and just crazy playing the fiddle. I'm a fiddle player, so I was just just insane. You know, I'll do anything for a drink. So uh, what happened at that radio station was they kept calling me in the office, calling me in the office, calling me in the office. And, you know, he'd say, what's wrong with you? And I'd say, I don't know. I don't know, but I'll do better. Because I had no idea, but it was apparent to them. And I'm, I'm one of the owner's brothers. He's a little brother, so it's a little political. So the, the Yuma County Fair came up, and uh, he calls me into the office. He goes, okay, the Yuma County Fair is this weekend. Scooter's got to be there. Oh, and they're not paying me. They're not paying me anything. Okay, so I'm really, I'm a mascot with a resentment, and I'm drunk, and <laughs> they're nothing. I mean, I'm not even getting gas mileage. I'm just beside myself. So he says, well, this weekend is the Yuma County Fair, and Scooter's got to make an appearance, but under no circumstances are you to ride the buffalo, because they have a, a celebrity buffalo ride, right? So I pound down a six-pack, and... And I start walking around the grounds. Of course, you could see me from outer space, this big outfit. And uh, all of a sudden, the kids, it sounded like there's 300 kids chanting my name. Now, I don't know if that was true or false, but Scooter, Scooter, Scooter. And so they had all these buffalo lined up. And there was one buffalo left. And so, um, you know, the chanting and cheering, I, I got on the buffalo. Now, it occurred to me in hindsight that this probably wasn't a real good idea. Number one, because the buffalo had never seen anything this colorful or big <laughs> that was about to get on his back. And so this is 800 pounds of beast. And, and I'm getting on there. And when they're tying my hand in, just like a buck and bull, I said, man, this is real. Boom. Away we go. And it's like 2.5 seconds of pure hell. I couldn't believe it. I was off that buffalo so fast, I couldn't believe it. it rolling around in the dirt. Thinking, oh, my God. And so... One last time, one last time, I'm, I'm in front of the general manager, and he says, okay, you had to ride the buffalo, didn't you? Said, you know the kids. And uh, so I went in a, a couple of days later. I went in, and this is after about a six-month stint here. And what's happening to me is, is that when I went there, I was living on a golf course. And six months later, I'm living in a little trailer in between lettuce fields, and there's literally crop dusters flying over the top. And I'm eating out of cans. And I'm uh, absolutely, my health is failing rapidly, and I don't know what it is. And I'm lonely, and I'm afraid. There's nobody to talk to. You can't go to the biker bar and tell the guys you're feeling afraid and insecure, you know. you got to keep an image up. So what happened for me was I, I went in and uh, to the general manager, and he says, we got an account for you. And I said, perfect. What is it? And he says, it's a recovery center. And I said, perfect. 
So it was my job as an advertising executive to find out about their business and then write these commercials. So I went over and I said, okay, so I understand you're from a recovery center. And he said, that's right. I said, well, what do you recover? I thought it was a tow truck service or something. And they said, <laughs> they said we work with people with alcohol and drug problems. And I thought, that's fascinating. And I, <laughs> I didn't look them in the eye the rest of the day, you know, but... During the interview, I found out about their business, and, and so it was my job to write these commercials. So I, I called the lady later that day, and I said, this is what I got. I says, I feel helpless, and I feel hopeless. My wife divorced me. I can't keep a job, and I can't stop drinking. She said, that's perfect. It was, it was like a little first step, you know what I mean? And then so somebody suggested that I record that part of it, that I record that part of it, and then they'd have the announcer come in to do, you know, well, if if you're having a problem like this guy, <laughs> go to go to the Crossroads Recovery Center, whatever it was. And uh, so I'd gone back to San Diego, and and FM radio is its line of sight, right? So they got the tower, and that beam just goes out like this. So I was coming back to San Diego on my way, and it's I'm dropping down in to El Centro, which is quite a ways away, but I hit that perfect beam, and it's the middle of the night, one in the morning, and my voice comes out over the radio, and it says, I feel helpless, and I feel hopeless, and my wife divorced me, I can't keep a job, and I can't stop drinking. I thought, oh, God, now everybody knows. <laughs> so <laughs> what happened through that process is I ended up 12-stepping myself into this treatment center because <laughs> they, were, uh, they were tired of my little act. And, uh, so a few days later, they said, well, you can either quit or resign, or, or we're going to fire you. So I said, well, you know, do I have insurance? And they said, yes. And I said, well, there's this little treatment center that <laughs> happens to be down the street. Can I go there? And they said, definitely, please go there. So I, w I went to this little 10-day treatment center in Yuma, Arizona. And, uh, you know, I'm strutting around there like, you know, I'm the guy that made you famous. I got you on the air, man. And they're staying stuff like, just make your bed and come to group, Jeff. Uh, you know, so the humiliation, incomprehensible demoralization. So what happened for me, and it was on St. Patrick's Day, 1987, a member of Alcoholics Anonymous came in to that little treatment facility, and he talked about how he felt before he took a drink. And he talked about this fear that I'd never heard another human being talk about before. This fear that just pre this that saturated my soul, that I'm afraid of everything. I'm afraid of people. I'm afraid of cops. I'm afraid, you know, I, I can't, I haven't been seeing my daughter. I can't hold a job. All this, he talked, I mean, it was like he just burned a hole through my soul with his talk. And he talked about getting some relief when he drank. I went, oh, my God, this guy knows. This is the first time I've ever identified with a human being, and he talked with such frank and frankness and honesty about I couldn't believe it. And I figured, how much are they paying this guy? You know, come to know after doing it for a couple of decades now, we do it for fun and for free. And then he talked about getting active in Alcoholics Anonymous and how it had changed his life. And he had me. He had me. I was like, oh my God, this is this is the deal for me. Now I know a lot of help. I I, I know a lot of four-letter words, but help isn't one of them. You know, help isn't one of them. How do you do this thing? How do I cite them? Where do you go? How do you do that? This guy walked out, and the message of Alcoholics Anonymous was delivered succinctly and with the, with the uh, language of the heart. And uh, God, it, it affected me. That I didn't find out where any meetings were. I didn't do anything like this or that. And, and uh, so a few days later, when I got released from this treatment center, uh, my girlfriend at that time, we'll just call her the nudist. She was fun, but anyhow, um, she picked me up and we went out to dinner. And that's a whole different talk. But, uh, we went out to Chinese dinner and I ordered Pepsi. And she says, you usually get Budweiser. And I said, I just spent 10 days in this treatment center. I have a pretty good idea. I shouldn't drink. And she said, beer has never been a problem for you. Beer has never been a problem for you. I said, you know, you're right. <laughs> That's what every alcoholic wants to hear, right? You know, beer's not a problem. You drink that, you know, drink the, drink O'Doul's or something. I mean, there's alcohol and all that stuff. So I took a drink. I went down so smooth, I took another one. And I took another one, and I took another one. And the next thing you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just out. I'm out. I'm gone. I'm going. 
I'm running. I'm living on my brother's ranch, doing some work for him. I get running out of that neighborhood. It's bad when you get fired from your brother's house. You know, it's bad. And uh, so I'm living here and there, and occasionally pop in on mom and dad. And, you know, I I can't even imagine uh, the hell I put my parents through for years. But uh, so anyhow, I ended up back down in San Diego and kind of hanging out. I'm still playing fiddle. I'm I play today too. So that I think that was one of the only reasons I, I stayed alive was because I had some kind of artistic outlook. But, so I'm going down there and uh, you know just just every day was a grind and a grind and a grind. So I get arrested a couple times and I don't arrest well. I don't jail well either. And uh, and uh, I'm down there and hanging out down there and and I'm living by the lake, Lake Murray, the, the lake I used to fish out when I was a kid. And I'm living between the golf course and, and the lake, and I'm collecting cans. And uh, this is my my work experience before I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm collecting cans, and then I'm taking I'm putting wax and sand in them to weight them down. And I, I go, you know, my filthy clothes, and I, I go to the to the line, and I didn't know that when you weighted cans down that they tumble backwards down the little thing, the little conveyor belt. So my cans start tumbling backwards. This guy rips it over, and he looks at me and goes, "What's this?" I said, "The guy that gave me the cans weighted them down. I don't know. I don't know." You know, our book talks about a pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. I know what that feels like. I can't look a soul in the face. I walk down the street and mothers and kids step on the other side of the road. And I didn't know I was just winding down. I was just finding my bottom. You know, and it comes to us in many ways. My bottom may not be yours. There's, there's a lot of different ways. But uh, for me, I was, I was very close. And, and so what happened was I went into for my next arraignment. And I was seeing people in front of me, and they were going, uh, the judge would say, well, what are your options here? And one guy said, well, you know, I'm going to Alcoholics Anonymous. And he goes, okay, well, we'll give you three years probation. Well, I'm alcoholic. I'm not stupid. You know, I'm looking doing 90 days or going to Alcoholics Anonymous. So I, I came here on a court slip, court card, with no expectation of getting sober, no idea what I was getting into, no idea that this was going to be what it was. And I just wanted to see my little girl again. You know, I had a son through a different relationship, and I hadn't seen him since he was an infant. And I wondered about him and hoped him for some day to be with him. So what happened was I started coming to Alcoholics Anonymous on court card, and I started to hear little bits of my story. I started to hear people that drank like I did, and they felt like I did, and they did the stuff I did. And, and I identified, my God, I'm an alcoholic. I have been an al- I have been drinking alcoholically since I was 13 years old. Had no idea. You know, the other the, the part of about alcoholism for me, you know, the spiritual malady it talks about the physical, mental obsession, the physical uh, craving for alcohol, physical addiction to alcohol. It talks about the me- the mental obsession too that somehow some some way it's going to be different this time. You know, I'm just going to have a couple and I'm really going home or I'm not going to drink because it's Monday, and I'm going to stay sober the entire week. And by 4 o'clock, I think I've changed my mind. I think it's me that's making the decision to drink, and it's not me. It's my body craving alcohol. And so, you know, the other part of the the deal is the spiritual malady. I didn't know that. I didn't know that the spiritual malady was was resentments and fear and, and regrets for the things I've done to people, the way I've treated people in my life. So I've got that whole thing. So when I'm physically sober too long, that's when alcoholism really kicks in, man. It kicks in with a fury because I got nothing to, I got nothing to block it off. And it just, it starts rolling through my brain like a projector, you know, like one of those old projectors with those spots in it and stuff. And, and, uh, you know, the first few days I just laid on my father's couch and I sobbed like a wounded animal. I just cried because it was all coming back and I couldn't believe what had happened. So I, when I started coming to AA, I, uh, I started to hear people get jobs. I thought, wow, I got a, at 30 days of sobriety, I got a job. Man, and I, I couldn't have been. I was working in the shipyards, and that's a rough and tumble place to, to work, uh, especially to get sober. And so I'm working down at the shipyard, and, and uh, you know, I heard about people seeing their kids again. And at six months of sobriety, I, 
I got to see my daughter, Sarah. I hadn't seen her in four years. And, and with tears in my eyes, I met her with two dozen yellow roses, not knowing for sure that this was going to work. But I told her that, that uh, I'm going to do this, and we're going to be together, and we're going to do this thing. And I, she just called me tonight. We have this fabulous relationship. You know, it's just remarkable what happens to the family. Our book talks about the family afterwards. It talks about chapter to the employer, and it, it talks about chapter to the wife. I, I, I was not much of a husband either. Funny thing is that my current wife sponsored my ex-wife for about a year. <laughs> and if you don't, know, I, I, deep inside, I'm, oh, you're sponsoring her. Oh, that's wonderful. It's, it's funny. Oh, oh, she's going to tell you the steps to that. Good thing her second husband was a bigger jerk than I was. I don't know. But she's a wonderful woman. She's a wonderful m- member. She's a, she's a good gal. And uh, we have a very tight relationship. So at uh, six months of sobriety, I saw Sarah again. And then uh, a little later on, I was to see my son, Ryan, and try to build a relationship with him. It took quite a while. And uh, so I went to work for this company and, and uh the shipyards, and then I ended up going to work for this little coffee company that's just down the street here in Seattle, and uh, entry level position. And all I know, all I know how to do is I know a little bit about electrical, I know a little bit about plumbing, I know a little bit about construction. But what I have is is the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I've got a sponsor who is not shy about giving me direction. And so I'm constantly calling him, and he was a journalist. And, uh, you know, I was getting in trouble with sending emails and stuff. He'd go, okay, well, send me the email. He goes, oh, kid, you got to clean this up a little bit. It's, you're painting people in corners and then hitting them in the face, you know. you got to level off a little bit. So, it was a, you know, it was a com- combination of great sponsorship. Um, you know, I turned my will and my life over to the care of God as we understand. And I think that is probably the most important words in a guy named Jim B. was... Um, at least partially is responsible for that, one of the first 100. And, you know, the, they fashioned the uh, We Agnostics chapter after Jim Jim Burwell's um, experience in AA, and he was a wonderful member of, God, of, of Alcoholics Anonymous. He didn't like the God stuff. So they brought in this little phrase, God as we understand him. Hmm. So that means I, I can uh, kind of choose my own understanding of God. So I did that. Based on what other people were telling me, is that I want somebody who's lying, kind and loving and available, and he's not out to get me. And if I take care of all this other stuff, that we're going to develop a relationship that gets better over time. You know, I end up doing the fourth step uh, three times. The first couple of times, I I just did the three columns in the book. You know, when you look at the book, and there's three columns, right? And it just says three columns. You know, who am I resentful at? What do they do to me? How did it affect me? And then I didn't get to the, you know, the fourth column, which is on the next page. It says we looked at the book from an entirely different angle. It says we put out of our minds the wrongdoings of others. Where were we to blame? Where were we selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and frightened? I went, oh, my God. So that's where I got the freedom is doing, doing the fourth step right out as it is in its entirety out of the big book. And, uh, you know, the book talks about... You know, selfishness, self-centered, self-seeking, driven by a hundred forms of fear and self-delusion. Other than that, I'm pretty squared away. Uh, <laughs> I've got good balance going on. And, and so I've come to understand the grave nature of this. And then it talks about the fear inventory, you know, that we list our fears in front of us in black and white. You know, where, where did self-reliance fail? Self-reliance failed me in every direction. So I had to look at something beyond that. And we say that little prayer, and we immediately commenced to outgrow fear. Now, I've grown, outgrown a lot of clothes, and I've outgrown a lot of fears, too. The fears that drove me and dominated me when I came into Alcoholics Anonymous are just no longer there. They're gone. They have disappeared. They have been removed in the sixth and seventh steps. Now, there's kind of like whack-a-mole. Something different will come up once in a while. Yeah, but then I had to look at the sexual part of the inventory, too, and, and I had a lot, a lot of wreckage in that area. And um, so it was, I'm just glad. You know, I've spent the last several years working on that. And in the sixth step, you know, I shared all this with different human beings at different times. And, man, I had a spiritual awakening of, of magnitude. I, 
out of doing it in the book. I had a glowing light room experience as a director. So, you know, they say, do this step and then go home and, and lay down, you know, review it. And man, it came on me and it forever changed my life. Alcoholics Anonymous, I fell in love with Alcoholics Anonymous somewhere around the third step when I really took it, 22 months of sobriety. I caught fire with this, some convict asked me to sponsor him. Two tall toms, six foot nine, one tooth, prison tats. He asked me to sponsor him and I was afraid to tell him no. <laughs> and uh, next thing you know, I'm sponsoring a whole gang of convicts. And uh, man, it came on. You know, I was catapulted into the fourth dimension, as our book talks about. And I've been on fire with Alcoholics Anonymous ever since. And there's something deep inside. Once you once you've been here for a while, if you've come to Alcoholics Anonymous, it may seem uncomfortable. It may seem awkward. You know, going through the steps is counterintuitive to the way we've been living life. But you got to stay. Just stay and do it. And then slowly, it doesn't matter what your motives are. If you take the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, your life will change. Your life will change. And so, uh, you know, the list of amends were very, very, very long. I mean, it says, make a list of all the people we had harmed. Well, there was a huge list, more than was on my fourth step. I mean, there was a lot of people. There was a lot of violence. There was a lot of this. There was a lot of that. So I've, you know, been whittling it away for a while now. And so some of the greatest amends are just fabulous. I mean, uh, just, you know, the living amends with the ongoing amends, I should say, with the family, becoming a father, really becoming a father and being accountable to, to my children, being accountable. Uh, I met my wife, Anita, when we were down in San Diego, and uh, she gave me two stepsons out of it. Now, I treated them like stepsons for a while, and so there was some friction there. When I stopped treating them like stepsons, and just started treating them like God's kids, our house came into unity. It was a beautiful thing, beautiful thing. And I wish I could have created I wish I thought that up. I mean, my wife and, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous gave me all that stuff. And uh, so, you know, one of the amends, I owed a friend of mine for a long time, and it was based towards violence, and I hadn't seen him for, you know, 30 years. So I finally found him through Facebook, and we used to play in bands together, right? So we played in bands together back in the 70s, and uh, I looked him up, got a hold of him, and said, hey, can I come talk to you? And he goes, yeah, well, I'm in Orange County. I said, I don't care. Can I come see you? And he goes, yeah. He goes, are you still playing fiddle? And I said, yeah. He goes, bring your fiddle. So I went and made a face-to-face direct amends to, to my friend, Donnie, and um and what happened was uh, we started playing music together and we ended up cutting a CD together. And gosh, I never saw that coming as a result of this. Well, the other men, you know, I was talking with Maria and Mark and those, and earlier, when, and I'm just going to go back a, a little bit. When I, we were in third grade or second grade, Maria said it was the, the next biggest event that happened in our school other than John Kennedy getting shot was uh, a... Uh, I was playing with my best friend Jim, and we were walking through the cloak room, and I took a stick pin and I stuck him in the butt, Jim Mertzbacher. And uh, so I start running full speed across the classroom, which is kind of like Elmer Fudd in a sprint, you know. And Jim takes this dodgeball and he hurls it across the classroom, hits me in the back of the head. I go down, I hit a, I hit a table, and my forehead blows open, and I'm bleeding all over the place, like instant victim. Right? Instant victim. All of a sudden, I'm a turban. I got stitches in my head. Jim Mertzbacher's a bad boy. I'm sure he got in trouble. I'm sure he got in trouble. Completely. I felt so bad about it. I got a hold of him last year and let him off the hook as a director. I did. I had to replay that situation. That's, you know, it's kind of one of these, kind of one of these things. The amends are, are, are kind of for us too, but they help other people because all these years he got in trouble with his parents. All these years, he thought it was some kind of a provoked thing that he just did. And he lived with that for years. And I told him that story, and he goes, um, wow. And I got to let him off the hook for doing that. Not that he was, you know, an alcoholic, and not that you know, he's a good, good guy, but it was still one of those areas that I got a lot of relief. And he got relief, too, because he knew it wasn't, it was provoked. 
So, uh, you know, in our 10th step, we continue to take personal inventory on I'm wrong, promptly admit it. I'm starting to learn the idea of promptly, you know, and I'm getting better. The sooner we take care of that, keep our spiritual house clean, the more effective we become. We become effective people. You know, our book says we're growing understanding and effectiveness. And in, in, in our book, it talks about combining the 10th and the 11th step as a, as a way of living, seeking you know, through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understood and praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry that out. That's all I do is I get up and say, what do you got? What do you got in store today? What's the next indicated thing? Treat people with kindness and respect. Be accountable. Do what you're supposed to do in AA. Do what you're supposed to do at work. My old sponsor, Barney, used to say, just show up and look alert. You know, don't say anything, you know. <laughs> It was great. Vince and I were talking about it briefly before the meeting. He was just a wonderful AA member. He goes, just shut up, look alert, do what they tell you to do. And uh, so I did that. And, you know, uh, working for this copy company, I went from an entry level position up to a senior manager in, in a period of you know, 14 years, 13, 14 years. Remarkable. I mean, that just doesn't happen to people like me. That doesn't happen to people that are collecting cans by the side of the lake. Stuff like that doesn't happen. It's just, it is physically and mentally impossible that all things are possible through spirit, through the spiritual aspects of a program. So I, uh, I did a lot of that stuff out there and Anita and I moved to Northern California. I was up with that company out of San Francisco. You know, a lot of people in the Bay Area, uh, just did Alcoholics Anonymous. That's all we did is AA. And then, you know, in our 12th step, the 12th step, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry this message. And I'm no expert. I'm not an authority on program on the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm not an expert or authority on the traditions. I'm not an expert or authority on anything. But I do have experience. And my experience has been that uh, I had a spiritual awakening as a result of this, and I started sponsoring guys in my life that changed dramatically, dramatically. I tried to carry this message, excuse me. Yeah, I try to do whatever I'm asked to do in Alcoholics Anonymous. And we get the great opportunity to go into the Tatchby State Prison, and I went into the San Mateo County Jail for a decade, three or four nights a month. And we go into the prison, my wife and I, one of our dreams, I know a lot of couples probably don't have this dream, a lot of couples probably don't dream things like this. But it was to go in arm in arm into a state prison someday. And, and we do that. We go in arm in arm with shank proof vests on <laughs> into the level three yard. And I tell you, it's romantic if you're in AA. <laughs> kind of gets me a little teary eyed, uh, just thinking about that. But we have, you know, this is the best, this is the best deal on earth. This Alcoholics Anonymous is the greatest show on earth. And I don't mean bills and whistles. I'm talking about real life stuff. I'm talking about people that come in here absolutely beaten down and the sense of uselessness and the sense of guilt and shame and remorse and fear. And all of a sudden you see them get a job. And you see them see their family again. You see them start to rebuild this family unit. And you start, see them start to become active members of Alcoholics Anonymous. You see them get in the middle of the thing. We get to see their lives change right in front of our very eyes. We're in a front row seat watching this miraculous process work in people that I wouldn't bet $5 on that they would make it. And they come in and they start to change right in front of your eyes. You shouldn't, if you're new to Alcoholics Anonymous, please, please stay with us. Let it become part of your story. Let it become part of your life. Wrap your arms around Alcoholics Anonymous and let us wrap our arms around you. I, you know, I don't try to fit in a meeting here or there. It's dangerous. Uh, you know, I've built my life around Alcoholics Anonymous. It's the only thing I know. Everything I do, after a while, the program of Alcoholics Anonymous starts to work me. If I'm not working as like, uh, you know, getting a little nudge from the big guy or whatever it is. Uh, so Anita and I lived in San Francisco, and we had a wonderful time up there, and we moved back to San Diego, and, you know, a couple little things happened back in San Diego. We ended up losing our house in Northern California. You know, the big the big bust, we lost our, our dream home. I uh, 
you know, ended up uh, losing my job with Starbucks. They retired me out. So I lost, you know, I was making six figures. And all in 90 days, we lost this house, lost my six-figure job. And then I had a stroke that took out half of my vision on the left-hand side. That in AA is called a spiritual trifecta. <laughs> it drove me to my knees one more time, you know, and it drove me to the point of asking for rides. Can I get a ride to a meeting? Can I go here and go? Didn't drive for almost a year. Learned how to drive again by doing a series of increasingly larger right-hand turns. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, a lot of things have happened, and, you know, we end up selling that home and bought a little house up in Tehachapi. And we just love it up there. Absolutely love it. we got a bunch of grandkids. we got twins on the way. Uh, our grandkids know where we are. Our kids, um, you know, I, unfortunately, I hate to, you know, report my son Ryan struggled with his disease. And uh, either could not or would not completely give himself to the simple program. They read it in every meeting. And, and his alcoholism and drug addiction turned into severe mental illness. And he took his life on January 23rd. And tough pill to swallow. But I've seen by the living and dying examples in Alcoholics Anonymous that if you drink over anything, you'll drink over anything. If you'll drink over anything, you'll drink over anything. In the last seven months, we lost my brother and, and just a lot of stuff there. But I tell you, taking a drink of alcohol or doing anything never occurred to me to increase, uh, to be a solution. It just never occurred. Alcoholics Anonymous kicked in. Just can't imagine how much love is is in this room and how much love is out there. We ever get through that with dignity and grace and, and uh, go through that whole process. And You know, our book talks about seeking professional help, too. And I, I've been seeing a, a, a psychologist running some stuff about my son uh, and his plight and his challenges through this guy. So immediately when it happened, he was familiar, and I was able to go see a psychologist about it and kind of get some some clarity. And I'd been going to Al-Anon, too, for about a month. Just, you know, when the kids are out there, uh, you just don't know. And I just was always expecting that it could very easily happen. And uh, unfortunately, it did happen. So, you know, we get through it and uh, without taking a drink. And my sponsor was there. And the beautiful thing about the 12 Steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, the beautiful thing about having a sponsor was my sponsor was with me the entire way. He knew exactly what we were doing. He knew exactly the situation with my son. And I've come to the conclusion that uh, that there's nothing else that could have been done. There's just nothing else that could have been done. And there's 1% that it said if you would have done this one last thing, that 1% will always be there. But I'll tell you, the, the program of Alcoholics Anonymous allowed me to see it in its entirety and what it looked like. So I uh, I don't regret the past or wish to shut the door on it. So a lot of stuff has happened in AA that uh, this is just a remarkable, remarkable life. God, I, you know, I've seen so many people. I've got to know so many friends. You know, the hospitality of this group is just phenomenal. I, I, you know, Mark, thank you again. Wherever you're sitting, where are you sitting, Mark? Yeah, right there. Thank. I want to thank Mark. And we had a lovely dinner tonight. And uh, you know, the the family afterwards too is. Uh, uh, my mother got to see a sober son for nine years, and my father got to see a sober son for eighteen years, and that's a big deal. We got to make this ongoing amends. We'll make the weekly calls and the daily calls, and to be there for the passing of others, to be there holding their hand. And to be there. And uh, that's not me, man. You know, my nature is is uh, to be loaded, drunk, living by the lake. You know, the thing about living by the lake, you know, <laughs> I thought it was camping for all that time. But uh, <laughs> apparently there's a school of thought that says that if you don't have a sleeping bag and you don't have a tent and you don't have a then it's probably not camping. It's, it's called homelessness. Uh, so you guys are a little judgmental. Or, well, I, I'm not going to say judgmental, but 
at least you brought the facts to light that, uh, uh, you know, I am what I am. You know, in closing, um, my, oh, thank you. <laughs> you guys really put it on on here, I'll tell you. God almighty. Expect to go on a river cruise just after we leave here. Uh, fireworks in the background, it's beautiful. Uh, you know, I'm closing. Uh, you know, my father was a, a World War II veteran, and uh, he was a great man. All the World War II veterans, you know, every, anybody who's been a veteran is, is a wonderful, wonderful person. Thank you for your commitment. Uh, but my father was a World War II vet. He loved sports. He played it. He was a Husky up here. He played football and, and all that stuff. And my brother would take him to Super Bowls, and my brother got to meet the president. Uh, he had the president and vice president of the United States over for a fundraiser at his law office. My father got to see a sitting president and a sitting vice president, got to meet those guys. And, uh, so, in his last days, wait. Thanks. Uh, in his last days, he was in, in, a, in a rest home, and it was the last time I got to see him and went to visit him. He's in a little wheelchair. And I started to say, Dad, you know about growing up? He goes, shh, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear it. He says, what those people, what those people in Alcoholics Anonymous have done for you. Just, I've, I've never seen any. It was the great, I'm sorry. Jeez. I, it was the greatest thing he ever saw in his life that affected his family was what you people here in Alcoholics Anonymous did for his son and the family. You know, my grandchildren, my grandchildren are, are grateful they've never seen me take a drink. My wives, my daughters, my kids, uh, you know, the police are really happy to no longer <laughs> wander around in Alcoholics Anonymous. And, uh, you know, there used to, there used to be a guy, I heard some tapes and, uh, a guy named Sam Shoemaker was one of the, uh, one of the, uh, spiritual guidance people for Alcoholics Anonymous when he was forming. He was a mentor for Bill in a lot of different ways. And I heard him say this prayer on a tape one time. And I just went, man, that is me. And I think it's us. I think it's us. And it goes like this. It says, I may not be what I want to be. I may not get, I may not be what I'm going to be. But thank God I ain't what I used to be. And that's my story. Thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.